Hello and welcome to the Oxford German Classic Podcast. My name is Karolina von Tropa and I'm a graduate student in the sub-faculty of German here at Oxford. And I also coordinate our essay competition for six formers, which is called a German Classic. And the aim of this podcast is to encourage six formers to engage with our set text for this year, which is Der Sandmann by Itia Hoffmann written over 200 years ago in 1816. It's a very eerie and mysterious short story, but before I say a bit more about it, I wanted to introduce you guys, my guests today. Mm -hmm. So I have three undergraduate students with me, Eve, Finn and Fabian. Hello guys, and thank you for coming. <laughs> um, so let me introduce you one by one. Um, I'll start with Eve. So, Eve, you're a first-year student of German and Spanish at Lady Margaret Hall. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself? So, where about you're from and what your favourite thing has been so far about studying German here? Um, so, I'm from Birmingham, so sort of in the middle of the country. And I'd say probably my favourite has definitely been um, translation, I'd say, probably into and out of the target language. I just really enjoy doing that and I've learned a lot more about it this year so far. So. Great, thank you. And next up, we have Finn, who's a second year student, also at Lady Margaret Hall. And Finn, you study German and linguistics, right? So tell us a bit more about yourself. Um, so I'm from Cardiff um, and I kind of love language in general. Uh -huh. um, so kind of the interdisciplinary kind of study of different cultures within literature. And I really like um, 20th century German literature with psychoanalysis, trauma and yeah, intermingled with history. It's really interesting. Okay, sounds good. And last but not least, we have Fabian. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a fourth year uh, from Cambridge. And I think the favourite, uh, or my favourite thing so far, has been seeing different movements and how they're related to each other, rather than just studying works kind of in isolation. So seeing how things kind of fit together, which I found very interesting. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. So I want to talk to you today about a very short passage from Der Sandmann that you had the chance to read beforehand. And I want us to understand better how this story is told and why the narrative perspective in the Zandman matters so much. So let me set the context a bit first. The first person narrator of the Zandman introduces himself as a friend of our protagonist, a young student called Nathanael. As a child, Nathanael used to be terrified of the Zandman or Sandman who is a character from folk tales who puts children to sleep. And Nathanael came to associate the Zandman with a friend of his father. Um, and this friend visited their father, their house, very often in the evenings. And Nathanael was really afraid of him. And so he also started being really afraid of the Zandman, this mythical character. And then many years later, Nathanael meets another man and his name is Coppola, and Nathanael remembers that the name of his father's friend in his childhood was Coppelius, and they also seem to be eerily similar to each other, and Nathanael gets it into his head that they must be, in fact, the same person. But everybody around him tells him that this cannot be true, so his fiance Clara and her brother Lotta tell him that he's making it up and he really shouldn't be this invested in the idea that Coppola and Coppelius are this demonic character who is threatening Nathanael. So we find out all this from three letters which are exchanged by Nathanael, Clara and Lotta and they form roughly the first third of the story. And it is only then that the proper narrator takes over and takes us deeper into the strange and wondrous story of the aftermath of Nathaniel's meeting with Coppola. And it is exactly this moment in the story that I want us to look at today. So this is the moment when the narrator steps in, takes over and makes himself known to us. So could one of you briefly walk us through what happens in this passage? Um, I don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. So it kind of starts with the narrator um, telling his reader, and he, he addresses a reader very specifically, um, about a story that um, he's heard about um, the student Nathanael, um, and how 
it's a very weird story. It's full of these contrasting emotions um, that you, you almost cannot imagine. Um, and then um, he goes on to um, talk about how he can begin the story, beginning to um, kind of tell the story to the reader. Mm-hmm. And he gives a few examples. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so maybe let's... Let's think about these different beginnings to the story that the narrator presents to us. So he gives us four options for how he could have chosen to begin this story. Um, Eve, can you walk us through these four options? Yeah, so he starts with like Esfa Einla, so sort of like a once upon a time sort of thing. Like Mm -hmm. that's kind of the typical um, way that everybody starts a story. Um, But he said that that just sort of didn't really do it justice. It's like um, too sort of down to earth. Um, and then um, he decided to sort of like locate it a bit more, so like where in Interclyde Provincialstadt. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was thinking about that one, um, but then he suddenly switches to the next one, um, like right in the centre of the action, mm-hmm. um, with this sort of like um, crazy glance and everything like that. Um, and he says that that is the one that he'd written down, but he decides that it sounds a bit comical without the context, so mm-hmm. he decides to um, discard that one as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and Fabian, what is he left with? What's the fourth option to start well, his, the story? His fourth option is to not start at all, mm-hmm. um, which is clearly kind of ironic uh, yeah. and said in jest, mm-hmm. um, given, given what we've just read. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So at the end of this passage that I've given you, the narrator says, I decided not to start at all. And then he goes on to describe how he uh, got hold of these three letters that precede this passage in the in the story, in its version that we the readers get. So, what do you make of it? The fact that the narrator spent so much time to explain to us how he could have chosen to begin his story. Um, I found it a little bit kind of superfluous or even a bit romantic like mm-hmm. with the capital R, like the, the vocabulary that he uses um, throughout the whole thing is never getting to the point. Mm-hmm. So it kind of creates some kind of mysticism about what is really going to come after, but at the same time it's a bit of an anti-climax at the mm-hmm. end where it's like, well, I'm not going to begin at all. And then it's the contradiction to the fact that well, if this even this paragraph takes place like a third of the way into the, the mm-hmm. story itself. So discussing the beginning quite far into the, the story is quite interesting or a little bit distorting maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's an attempt to kind of get the reader on board um, and the kind of narrators explaining how difficult it is to talk about kind of this kind of story. Um, and I think it, it serves a function of kind of um, not creating a, well, I guess kind of creating a complicity of the reader. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to show them that it's not so diff- well it's quite difficult uh, telling a story but in this way mm-hmm. um, and kind of drawing attention to that fact um, which is which is interesting I think going, I written down when I read it um, like the phrase duty of compliance mm-hmm. because I, I think especially at the start when um, the narrator singles out the reader and is referring to the reader like in the singular it's an informal pronoun mm-hmm. um, it's kind of an, it, it's enforcing the reader to take on the emotions or take on the experience Experience, mm-hmm. which the, um, the narrator sets out so it's forcing the reader to go along with whatever he says and to imagine it all it's not really giving any option to yeah. kind of disregard it yeah it's as though the narrator is reaching out of the page and just grabbing us by the collar and drawing us in right because he is as Finn said addressing the reader very directly several times in this passage what did you think about that Eve how did you make you feel? I think for me it just like came across as like a very self-conscious narrator. Mm-hmm. He's very aware of not just what he's writing but how it's going to be re- received. Mm-hmm. Um, so by trying to attempt to encourage the reader to sympathise with his plight and being able to articulate this story um, and it's a story that can't be articulated properly in language, he's immediately like making excuses for himself and sort of giving him that self, that safety cushion. Mm-hmm. If perhaps his story is not as um, well articulated as he wanted. I thought it just came across to me as quite perfectionist and he's got this sense mm-hmm. of he really wants to do this tale justice, especially as he you know, has a personal relationship to the person in question. Um, so for me, it was just very much like this consciousness of that everything he's doing is being watched and this need to justify himself. Mm-hmm. So what 
vision of storytelling would you say emerges out of this passage? How does the narrator present his task as a storyteller to us? Well, I think it's a challenging one, mm-hmm. as in it's not it's not something that that's easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a sense that he has to kind of, or the narrator has to come up with with new forms, basically, mm-hmm. in order to explain mm-hmm. or to kind of portray what he he wants to. Um, so, yeah, I think there's definitely an element of 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 this is kind of new territory in a way, mm-hmm. or at least at least trying to do something differently to avoid cliches and to find kind of new words. Mm -hmm. It's very conscious of narrative uh, construction I think and it almost Mm -hmm. sets out as being quite seemingly transparent and I'm Mm -hmm. not actually sure whether that is the case because I think if you analyse it a little bit deeper because of the I think whenever there's a list of adjectives it's always the the contrasting ones so maybe it's not as transparent it's kind of um, trying to cover his back I think like you were saying Eve like trying to do the story justice, but at the same time, maybe not being as clear as Mm -hmm. it could be. Yeah, I think you're touching on several very interesting points. So the notion of transparency and how this storyteller is ostensibly telling us everything about his own process of writing this story. But then if we really read it carefully, we can see that this in itself is a construction, right? Mm -hmm. So even though he's trying so hard to give us some kind of unmediated access to the story, he's actually mediating it the whole time. And then another interesting thing that you said was about the adjectives. So maybe let's um, have a look at the language used here. And and the adjectives are particularly interesting, I think. Would anybody want to comment on any example? Or even just looking at the very first two words? in the passage. I suppose said Sam on Wunderlicher. Mm-hmm. So you've got the contrast between something quite strange and like Zed Sam. Mm-hmm. Um, so it kind of connotes the idea of like mystery and uh, mm-hmm. something um, that maybe hasn't been experienced before. And then Wunderlich, which is the connotation of a miracle, mm-hmm. but also something aesthetically pleasing or... Um, yeah, I think they're both tapping into the sense of something that cannot really be explained away, that isn't fully intelligible. Um, And if you read this story in translation, I think you won't really see how these two words are really strongly emphasized in the German. How would you say are they emphasized in the German? Well, they're in the kind of comparative form and they're used in almost a superlatives kind of thing so that well Mm -hmm. um so there's nothing that could be um you know more or stranger or or kind of um more whatever than Mm -hmm. than, than this yeah so so partly it's the comparative form but this this we can capture in the english as well Um, placed at the start of the sentence Mm -hmm. which like they are in the translation because you can't really do it with the english syntax right and what do you think is the consequence of having these words placed so prominently at the beginning of this passage i think like straight away you're just sort of thrown into well you're given no context just given two like adjectives Mm -hmm. and it's only sort of near the end of the line that you actually understand what what it is he's trying to articulate. Uh Um, I think it just sort of sets the tone of the passage. It's quite like, as you say, with the comparatives, it's just, as it goes on, it gets quite hyperbolic and Mm -hmm. very, um, it's just like very intense as a passage, like the way that the language is used. So I think it just sort of sets that tone like quite well. Yeah. Yeah, again, hyperbole or exaggeration is an important term with this passage. Um, Can you talk a bit more about some other adjectives here that contribute to this atmosphere and this exaggeration that Eve was talking about? Um, well, there's a the bit um, kind of in the middle of the text here. Um, as wunderbarer, herrlicher, entsetzlicher, lustiger, grauenhafter. Mm-hmm. The list obviously they're made into nouns in the, um, in the mm-hmm. German. But you've got the repetition of some, like wunder. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's all these, they're very, um, I'm trying to think of a good word to describe them, but um, majestic, I don't think that's the right word, and um, adjectives, they kind of um, convey quite strong emotions or mm-hmm. strong um, feelings. Um, and then you've got contrast between like lustish, so like funny or comical, and then grauenhaft. Mm-hmm. And um, I think even it, like saying them, that it's quite like the, the, yeah, the, the sounds of all the adjectives together mm-hmm. kind of create this kind of feeling of distortion or... 
um, of these extreme yeah. emotions, right? Yeah, so I think there are a few factors at play here that you've mentioned, Finn. So first of all, we have a long list of these adjectives. Um, and we have several lists like this in the course of the passage. And then we have very stark opposites and contrasts. Um, so for example, lustige und grauenhafte. Um, in the translation, I really like how the translator managed to um, introduce some alliteration. So hilarious and hideous. I think this really captures these two opposites very well. Um, and and we also have this sense of, again, piling up of different adjectives and it gets so over the top that it's almost hard for us to take it seriously. And going back to what we said at the beginning, the narrator really seems to be aware of this danger of coming across as preposterous because one of the beginnings to the story that he had considered, he decided against precisely because he thought it would come across as um, I think the word he uses is possierlich. Um, yeah, um, or spaßhaft, uh, possierlich spaßhaft. So he does not want to kind of, um, he really is thinking about the kinds of emotional landscape that he's painting for his readers. And he wants to be very careful in how he makes us feel exactly. Um, are there any other adjectives here that you thought would be interesting to comment on? I, what I really struck me was um, mm -hmm. the sentence before the um, ellipses in Artif. Um, weil es doch jedes Wort als was weder vermag schien, die er farblos und frostig und tot. Mm -hmm. um, and the farblos and frostig und tot with them, um, the, like separated with und. Mm -hmm. And then you have the alliteration with the farblos and frostig. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of comes to an end on taught. I think even before um, that, like the accumulation of kind of um, emotion or um, uh, kind of language, which is quite emotive, and then it kind of ends on taught. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was really quite interesting. Um, yeah, contrasting kind of a lively mm -hmm. um, passage beforehand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it contrasts with um, the other adjectives, which kind of des describe light and mm -hmm. colour and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and also heat. So earlier, earlier on in the passage, uh, this talking about kind of um, even, even boiling or cooking or fermenting mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. and things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's quite a powerful um, end to the first part of the passage mm -hmm. um, in that it just kind of draws out those contrasts, which, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and like you say, is very striking in the way it ends. Yeah. So to add to this, it's also interesting to look at which words are described as fablos, frostig und tot. If you look at the, at the passage, which word specifically is the narrator here describing as fablos, frostig und tot? So it's every word that he's trying to use in his story, right? Mm -hmm. And we can assume that some of these words he's, he's just listed, right? So this long list that Finn talked about, wunderbare, herrliche, entsetzliche, alles wunderbare, herrliche, entsetzliche, lustige, grauenhafte, these are some of these words that he's suddenly finding fablos and frostig and tot. What, what do you think about this? The opposite of what we were kind of describing these adjectives as. Exactly, right? And what do you make out of this paradox? I suppose like this sort of like expression of like the inability to express the human experience in language because mm -hmm. we feel so intensely and I think often like language just can't like reflect that I think and like this so as you were saying about the whole idea of like the talk like ends of that all of the adjectives that you use like connote kind of being alive or like having life mm -hmm. and then to have the sort of fabulous frosting taught um, those words themselves are quite fabulous and frosting mm -hmm. um, so it's that idea of like there's, there's so much and there's, it's just so difficult to, like, so immense, it's too, too hard to sort of put into words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the dilemma that the narrator is facing, right? He's talking about these intense emotions that he's really trying to express, but he tells us he's failing. Now, do we really think that he's failing to express these strong emotions? What do you think? Or in other words, is he not being slightly too critical of himself here? 
I think it's also the paradox of narration mm -hmm. in the sense that the narrator has constructed this and decided what he's going to put on a page mm -hmm. and yet he, it's still kind of um, detailing the fact that well, it's not good or it's, it's, mm -hmm. this isn't what should be put on the page or I can't mm -hmm. express this and yet he has just expressed it. Mm -hmm. But by saying that he now no, no longer can express it, it kind of devalues what he's already said. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I feel like it's maybe it's a challenge to the reader and that um, kind of, well, like you say, the paradox and it's kind of maybe challenging the reader to, to see through that mm -hmm. or, or kind of, um, what, yeah, come to a different conclusion. Um, and it's kind of similar in arc as well to the, the second part where he describes various, or the narrator describes various things and then um, also kind of pulls the rug from under our, out from under mm -hmm. our feet. And says, actually, I, I didn't do it. So yeah, there's, there's kind of a, I feel it as a kind of challenge um, mm -hmm. to, to kind of read beyond or see beyond um, mm -hmm. the thing. I think it's interesting when you say see beyond or because of the imagery of like eyes and reflection throughout the whole thing, maybe mm -hmm. that's kind of meant to be um, kind of displayed within the way that the narrative is constructed, that it is, you're, you're viewing something through a particular lens which might be distorted. And then kind of the, the narrative then goes on to talk about eyes Mm -hmm. Yeah, the motif of eyes and looking and sight and watching is very prominent in the whole story. So I think that that's a really good idea here. Um, and maybe there's also a way of thinking about the narrator's critique of his own powers of expression as something that allows him to paradoxically be able to express more or to be more persuasive or in the end find these very hyperbolic statements that are going to do justice to what he's trying to say. Um, there's one other aspect of this passage that I wanted to ask you about, and it's the, um, it's the friends that the narrator keeps referring to. Uh, so he talks about his friends and how they would react to him trying to tell this story. W was there anything interesting about this that, that you noticed? So he reports a little dialogue between him and his friends who ask him, wie ist Ihnen verehrter? Was haben Sie teurer? So what's wrong, my dear fellow? Whatever is the matter, old chap? What, what do you think about this little dialogue? Well, <laughs> well I mean, it's kind of like they, they seem to think he's having visions and, and kind of seeing things or maybe, maybe kind of slightly mad seeing things which aren't there. Um, and I guess, again, links to the kind of seeing and, and not seeing that we've already kind of talked about um, uh, and the kind of gaze. Um, so yeah, I guess there's, there's that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, there's kind of like the discrepancy between like his inner, like his inner world and his outer world as well. And mm -hmm. that all of these amazing emotions that he's describing, that we feel so intensely because he's described it to us ironically in quite a good way mm -hmm. um his friends are just sort of like oh what's the matter um mm -hmm. and there's not that that grasp like of understanding so there's kind of that public and private persona that was mm -hmm. like played off against each other with the use of the friends mm -hmm. yeah so two interesting things i think that are emerging out of our discussion now are first of all that these friends are almost like proto-readers mm -hmm. so they are the first people who somehow respond to his story and because they fail to respond in the way that he would like them to, that's what really pushes him to make it better and to produce a better, more convincing, more compelling version for us, the actual readers. And then the second thing is that um, how the way that Eve described the narrator's attitude towards the world around him just now is also a perfect description of how Nathanael, the main character of the story, feels about his inner visions and how the world cannot grasp them or believe in them. So we seem to have a passage here that draws a parallel between the inner torment of Nathanael and the inner torment of the narrator. Um, what do you think about that? Why might it be important? I suppose it's important. It could, it kind of the narrator is a foil for mm -hmm. um, Natana, and it's another kind of reference point to mm -hmm. um, if he's able to um, convey this inner turmoil and this, this contrast, then we're more likely to believe Natana's mm -hmm. own mm -hmm. inner turmoil and contrast.
Yeah, I think that's exactly right. This, this little passage is priming us to be more receptive to Nathanael's torment that is going to be described in just a while, right? And that we've already glimpsed to some extent from the letters. Um, all right, was there anything else that, that you found interesting or striking about this passage? There is one more turn of phrase that, that, I, that I really noticed, and it's ein elektrischer Schlag. Um, so could one of you talk about this phrase and how it's used, what it's supposed to express here? Um, I kind mm -hmm. of put arrow to that phrase and put brutal, uh -huh. such intense. Yeah. Um, and it, uh, it kind of takes um, as a way from the more poetic language into something that's a little bit more say concrete, but you, you imagine somebody having an electric shock, mm -hmm. but equally how kind of particles like fuse mm -hmm. um, and how things come together, but with, with force and also with something that's maybe a little bit more magical or mystical mm -hmm. with um, electric, mm -hmm. especially at the time. Yeah. And I guess it's also something you can't see, you can't see electric shocks and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting parallel to, to some of the other yeah. things. But at the same time, you can really feel them, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. um, yeah. So this, this is a very powerful metaphor for how the narrator wants this story to work on us as well as readers, right? Um, an electric shock. Um, all right, there's one more um, phrase towards the very end of the passage that I wanted to ask you about. And that's um, in the very last line, um, the the Farbenglanz des inneren Bildes, that can be abgespiegelt. So the English translation here reads, unable to find words that seem to reflect anything of the prismatic radiance of my inner vision, I decided not to begin at all. Um, any thoughts about this image of a mirror and reflecting and the inner vision that somehow has to be reflected? I think in a way he kind of undermines himself because like, uh -huh. I don't know, like a reflection, like something's always lost in a reflection, you know, like it's never the real image. So mm -hmm. by saying that he's trying to find something to reflect it, yet he wants to capture it perfectly, it's quite ironic because mm -hmm. like I understand that reflection is the same image, but there's always there's always the difference. Or um, like some kind of distortion. Yeah, yeah, there's the idea of like light being distorted and prismatic as well, it's mm -hmm. exactly the same. So it's kind of like ironic that he's so that he spends the whole passage talking about how he wants to perfectly encapsulate mm -hmm. all of his emotions, and yet then he's saying that he wants to find something to reflect it rather mm -hmm. than to. Yeah, maybe a way to think about it is to see this passage as the narrator's struggle to find the perfect metaphor or image for the act of storytelling, and he's just trying out all these different powerful metaphors, such as um, ein elektrischer Schlag. And here, this image of reflection, and then this little scene of interacting with friends who can't quite understand you, and all the inner visions, and then these words that all seem farblos und frostig und tod. Maybe that's a way to bring our discussion to some sort of conclusion, um, to think about these different models for what it means to tell a story, um, and which one ultimately wins or is the most compelling. All right, that was a really good discussion. Thank you again for reading and discussing this passage with me. And um, for everybody listening or watching us who is interested in taking part in our competition, we will put a link to our website in the description box below, or you can just search for Oxford German Classic Prize to find out more. Um, thank you for listening and we hope you enjoyed it. We certainly did. <laughs> Uh, if you did, check out our other episodes. But for now, bye-bye and tschüss.